Okay. All right, I'm going to get started since uh, it's 8.32. Um, so today's lecture is going to be on op amps. So we're finally uh, switching away from analyzing uh, circuits and frequency responses and moving into amplification. Um, so the next three lectures are on op amps, and then we're going to go over MOSFET circuits and then that will be the end of the class. Um, yeah. Uh, before we, we switch gears, though, I wanted to spend a little bit of more time on the high pass filters just to make sure that everyone kind of is on the same page. So I made a couple extra slides just to kind of uh, uh, reiterate what I meant by we convert the high pass filter to a equivalent low pass filter design. So here, all I've plotted is actually three uh, frequency responses, and they're actually of the same H. So same frequency response. The main distinguishing feature is in one of them. So the, the X axis in all of them is omega. Uh, but in one of them, we plug in H of J omega, and then in the second one, we're plugging in H of J omega times omega P. And in the third, we're plugging H of omega P over omega. So what happens here is that when I plug in here for omega, J omega, so if I plug in here, uh, omega stop, I will get basically this value here. Now here, since I'm plotting J omega times omega P, so let me just make this nicer, omega times omega P, if I plug in here, omega stop over omega P, I will actually get uh, the same value as before. Uh, so does this make sense? So basically on the x-axis, you see that omega s over omega p corresponds to this same note, uh, same location in the x-axis. And since here I'm plugging, I'm actually plotting h of 
j omega p over omega. Um, if I plug in for omega, omega p over omega s, that's actually equal to h of, wait, uh, j omega p over omega p over omega s, which is of course just equal to h of j omega s, basically. Uh, and so as a result, if I, if I uh, look at here at the x-axis where omega p over omega s is, I see that uh, the same value is attained. Um, I can continue doing this little game. So basically I can also do this for omega c. And so then this, oh, sorry, uh, let me just, just uh, try to be more pedagogically friendly. So if I plug in omega c here, then it's gonna be end up being here. And then again, by the same argumentation, if I plug in omega c here over omega p, well, omega c over omega p should give me the same value as h of j omega c. And so it should be here. And then here I would have to plug in omega p over omega c in order to get h of j omega c. And so that would actually occur here. Um, I, yeah, so finally, just uh, to reiterate and also to let people come in. Now, if I do the same thing for omega p here, then I can do the same thing for omega p or omega p over omega p. So I plug in omega p over omega p into omega here, and I'm just gonna get h of omega p, which is just this value. And then here I would have to plug in uh, well, h of omega p over omega p, which is again just one. So we see actually something very interesting that the the stop band of the high pass filter, right? And the top band of the low, low pass filter are actually uh, have the same uh, H min. So that's number one, right? So we maintain the H min, but additionally, uh, the distinguishing feature between these two is where that stop band is located. For, for this one, it's located at omega s or capital omega s, which is just omega p over omega s. And for this one, it's actually located at lowercase omega s. So that's the only distinguishing feature between the stop bands of these two, two uh, filters is that uh, the stop band for one is located at omega s and the other one's located at capital omega s. For the pass band, we can actually say the exact same thing, which is that if we look at our pass band, this one's located at little omega pass, and this one's located at uh, omega or capital omega pass, which is equal to omega p over omega p. Now, more importantly, the specification of H max is the same for both filters. So what we get here is that these two filters have the same gain specifications for their stop and pass band respectively. The only distinguishing feature is that the pass band and stop band are related reciprocally, effectively, times a constant omega p because the book decided that. Um, that's not necessary, but because we did this extra middle step, we pick up this omega p over omega s. So as a result, if we want this filter, which has a h of j omega, if we want that filter, 
Uh, all we have to do is design this filter, which has a J H of J uh, omega P over omega. So we just have to design this low pass filter and then convert it to H of uh, J omega. And to do that, we just have to replace this omega here with omega P over omega. So if we if we were to basically plug in this thing for omega, right? That would give us H of J omega. So can can anyone actually let's see if, if all of you are understanding what I'm trying to say. Can anyone tell me what that means that has to happen to S in our circuit? Can anyone no one? So remember before, if I wanted, if I wanted to go from H of S, so let's say I have this circuit that has this frequency response. And if I wanted to go from H of S to H of S over KF, I just simply replace every S with an S over KF. So now, if I want to go from one over S or okay, omega P over S to S, what do I have to replace every S by? Exactly. So basically I'm going to define an S prime equal to one or omega P over S. Yeah, and so that's how I'm gonna basically translate my circuit. Okay, well, what does that mean in terms of the individual constituent lump elements? So the impedance of our resistor is R, there's no S's, so nothing happens to the resistor. Now, when we look at our inductor, the inductance is SL, or sorry, the impedance is a cell, but now that needs to become uh, L times uh, omega P divided by S. Well, what has an impedance that looks like this? Exactly, so this becomes a capacitor with capacitance of one, over omega P L. So remember that this is equal to one over S C. So C has to be one over omega P L. Okay, and let's say our low pass filter had some capacitor now, one over S C. So because we want to redesign it, uh, we wanna change every S to one omega P over S, well, then we have to basically define a new circuit that's S, or sorry, omega P over S C, and that's really uh, S over omega P C. And then what kind of an element? Yeah, I need to. Yeah. Okay. What kind of an element has a uh, impedance? that looks like S over omega PC. Yeah, so the capacitor becomes an inductor and the new inductance L is actually one over omega PC. And so if we take our circuit, we replace every capacitor with an inductor, change the, uh, the parameter value to what I just prescribed, what we're gonna get is that we're gonna go from a transfer function of a low pass filter to a transfer function of a high pass filter. Um, and so that's effectively what we're doing. Um, we're, we're cheating when we're building these high pass filters. We're saying, well, we know how to uh, design low pass filters. So we're just gonna figure out what these specs look like 
in the low pass filter domain. And so that's why we're going to define these capital omegas. Once we define these capital omegas, then we're going to say, okay, we found our circuit. We replace capacitors with inductors and inductors with capacitors. And that's our high pass filters. So that's basically the end uh, result. So you need to replace omega with, uh, whoa, okay. Da, da, da. Already made a mistake. Omega P over omega. And uh, that means that we need to take every low pass filter and low pass filter capacitance and inductance and replace it with uh, low pass, high pass filter inductance and high pass fit filter capacitance with respective values equal to this. So that's effectively how we're designing these low pass filters. On the way here, we define the equivalent low pass filter stop band and pass band frequencies, which are omega pass equal to one and omega stop equal to omega pass over omega stop. Once we have the specifications of H max, we keep the H max and the H min, so those stay the same. We can just plug into our formulas to design our low pass filter. Once we have our low pass filter, then we use these formulas to design our high pass filter. And that's it, that, that, that's all I was, uh, of course, what's confusing about this is that we're adding this extra step, which you don't really need. But uh, in the past, I've tried to remove this step and it's caused more confusion. So I just, because then people see this formula and then they're like, wait, but this is a formula in, in the book. And, and so, so that's why I've decided to keep it because it results in confusion if I don't, but that's, that's effectively what we're doing. And I kind of redrew these graphs, but now with the loss, in case you didn't believe me, um, yeah, and you can do the same thing, kind of basically say, well, A of J omega S is equal to A of J omega S over omega P times omega P, which is equal to A of J, uh, what is it, uh, omega P divided by omega P over omega S. So you can do kind of the same argument to say that uh, uh, the X axis will always be the thing I'm circling and uh, things remain intact. Okay, so yeah, so basically you can get to the same conclusion. All, I'm, all, all you have to do here is just replace the H's with A and the same arguments that I just said follow. Okay, go ahead. So don't we normalize by our corner frequency though, in order to actually really use our normalized design for a for these filters? Because we're normalizing by the passband frequency. I'm just I mean, I just do that. But we normalize you you, you, filter, you yeah. just don't need to normalize at all. So if you look here, if I if I had made this a one and I had made this a one and I had made this a one. But in order to design, you have to use the low pass filter. Doesn't that have to be normalized first and then we frequency scale that? So that's what we've been taught. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you define, I guess, what, okay. So, what you define here are these are your equivalent uh, uh, low pass parameters, mm -hmm. which are the same equivalent low pass parameters that are here. So, omega p over omega. So, basically, omega p over omega p, omega p over omega stop band, omega p over omega c. That's the capital omegas that you designed for. Yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to say is that uh, if you basically replace this with ones and then you make this all ones, you're still gonna get the same answer. It doesn't really, that omega P in the numerator has no bearing on your design. It's just something that the book added. 
But okay, so you define your low pass filter equivalent uh, omega capital omegas. Once you have these capital omegas, all you gotta do is just follow the low pass filter design uh, process. Here, this should be divided by omega p, but then omega p is one, so you just don't put it, and this should actually be omega p, but again, omega p is one, so it's, um, yeah. Uh, so if you actually look at this, this is a straight up copy, cut and paste from the low pass filter design lecture. The only thing that changed is that the lowercase omegas became capital omegas, that's it. Um, and then, once you find your correct low pass filter design, all you gotta do is again, replace capacitors with inductors and inductors with capacitors and then you're done. Are there any questions about this anymore or is this helping a little bit kind of make it more? Okay, cool. All right, so now let's start with our actual content for the lecture. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna talk about uh, uh, op amps or operational amplifiers, which from what I've heard, you've already built one in your lab. So you should be professionals at this. Um, but effectively, and yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I heard about this. I don't think they're very happy with us right now, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so uh, yeah, so. The operational amplifier basically has two rules. And then based on those two rules, everything just follows. Uh, effectively, the amount of current going into this terminal has to be zero. And the amount of current going into this terminal has to be zero. Additionally, no matter what, the difference between this voltage and this voltage will always be zero. Uh, so those are the two rules for an operational amplifier. And based on those two rules, you can just do KCL, KVL, and you can analyze these circuits. An equivalent uh, circuit for this is actually something that looks like this, which you should kind of, uh, or you've probably seen before, which is basically what you have here is an input current, and then you have a an internal resistance, and then you have a uh, voltage controlled voltage source here. Now, this is an ideal operational amplifier because as it turns out, this multiplication factor for this device here is infinite, meaning that if you have any voltage difference here, the output voltage should be infinite. Um, from that, actually it follows that the input voltage has to always be zero. So the difference has to always be zero because you're not gonna get output voltage that's infinite. Um, additionally, for this particular circuit, because there's no current coming into it. So that means that this resistance effectively has to behave like a short, sorry, like an open, so that there is no actual input current into the circuit. Uh, and so if this resistance is infinite, this is open, this is open. And so the current in has to be equal to zero. Um, and so in particular, this is the equivalent circuit, but this is the circuit we deal with. And we don't actually interface with these equations. We uh, interface with these two uh, constraints. And then based on these two constraints, we can solve circuits. So I'm gonna basically go over the simplest op-amp circuit. It's kind of like the hello world of um, operational amplifiers and it's called the non-inverted non amplifier. So can anyone tell me based on this, so this is V in, what the voltage here should be? Yeah, exactly. So since we know the voltage here and this voltage has to be equal to this voltage, then this has to be equal to V in. 
Additionally, um, if we can apply uh, KCL to this uh, circuit, so we have three currents. So we have basically Vn minus zero divided by Rn. So this is actually a Rn, it's Rf. And then, so that's the current in this branch. Then in this branch, we have V in minus V out. So plus V in minus V out divided by R F. And then how much current goes through this branch? Zero, so plus zero. That has to be equal to zero. Um, and now we can actually find the gain, which is actually just equal to V out over RF equals <coughs> one over R in plus one over RF. Uh, something wrong. Times B in. Oh yeah, non-inverting, okay, good, yeah. Okay, um, and then uh, we get here that this is actually just equal to Rf over Rn plus one Vn equals V out. And so the gain of the circuit is just Rf over, F over Rn plus one. Is that uh, clear? To everyone, have, have, how many of you have actually analyzed these circuits, type of circuits before? Okay, so a lot of you, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically how we analyze ideal operational amplifiers. Um, so we can look at a more interesting example now. So what if we have a capacitor here? So of course you could do this in the Laplace domain, um, things would also work there, but uh, yeah, but we're gonna do it in the time domain. So basically what we have here is we have that this terminal is grounded. So what does that tell us about this voltage? Yeah, so this voltage is also zero. And so now we have that uh, uh, the, so basically the current going this way is the Capacitance in DDT of the voltage drop, which is zero minus V in. And then the current going in this direction is just V out minus V in over RF. V out, or yeah, V out minus V in over RF. And then there's no current going into this terminal. So, so that's plus zero. That should be OB equal to zero, and then we can solve for the gain. So in this particular case, we have V out over RF equals uh, V in over RF plus C D D T of V in. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, and VN, this should be zero, not VN, I apologize. Because this is zero, not, I don't know. So here we have V out over RF equals C, D, V, N, D, T. And then we have V out equals R, F, C, D, D, T, V, N. Um, so basically, whatever voltage in we put in, what we're going to get out is the time derivative of that voltage amplified by a factor R times C, N. So that's why this is called the differentiating amplifier, because it takes the derivative of our input voltage. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the, wait, why is there a negative there? Uh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize. So this should be V out minus V and not V in minus V out. So zero minus V out. So then this should be a negative. This should be a negative and then you're good. Okay. Um, ideal, so now the differential amplifier. Wait, did I uh, put the answer in there? Okay, so to analyze an amplifier like this, what you have to realize is that what is this? Yeah, exactly. Since there's no current going into here, this thing is just dividing the voltage. Uh, and because the two resistances are equal, the voltage here is actually just the voltage over two, Vs2 over two. And then what does that tell us about Va? Yeah, so Va is actually Vs2 over two. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of, once you know Vs2, then you're just basically applying KCL. So you have uh, Vs2 minus Vs1 over R, Vs2 plus Vs2 minus V out over R. So that's what this thing is. So Vs2 over two minus Vs1 over R, Vs2 over two minus V out, uh, over R equals zero. Um, and then you can manipulate these equations. So you notice that there is uh, Vs2 over two twice. So that just becomes Vs2 over R. And then you have Vs1 over R. And then you have VO over one over R. So the over the R's cancel and you just get that the output voltage is actually just the difference of the two sources. Is that uh, yeah, clear? Okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, I'll give you all five minutes maybe to look at this and then I'll go over it. So let me share this. Okay.
All right, C can anyone tell me what the voltage here is? Yeah, exactly. So basically, like I said, I equals zero, which means that no current flows through this resistor. So I could have made this one mega ohm. Um, I could even like, I don't know, stick a Pokemon here or something. Still, the voltage would be zero volts because it uh, doesn't matter what I stick here, there's no current flowing through there. So what does that tell me about this voltage? Zero, yeah. At this point, does anyone from pattern recognition recognize the circuit? How many of you? <laughs> just three, four. So we just went over the circuit like two slides ago. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I always like, I'm always very impressed by like, uh, when you have these education researchers like because they they love this like flipped classroom idea and it's like you make a professor come up with like the best teaching methods and they're like let the students teach themselves <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant <laughs> yeah i mean i would have i could have thought of that you know it's much more comfortable for me you know <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> But yeah, so how many of you had trouble with this? Just be honest. Three, four, five, six. Okay, that's good. I am making a difference. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's let's uh we have two two currents coming out of here, and so we just need to apply KCL at this node and basically things will break down. So we have two microfarads times DDT of uh, zero minus V in plus um, zero minus three sine T divided by a uh, five times 10 to the five. And here, let's just write this as two times 10 to the negative six. <clears throat> okay, 
at this point, all you have to do is just basically, um, well, this is V out. So you would have to basically say that this, so for V in, so basically you have here that, so three over five times 10 to the five sine T equals two times 10 to the negative six D D T of V in negative. Um, and then you can basically invert this equation by integrating both sides of the equation and then you can get what uh, the input is. Um, I was just asking for the gain, so you could have just left this as V out, and then that would have given you kind of what the gain equation is. So at this point, this is kind of where we were in the previous slide. You just plug in here. Uh, you, you can integrate both sides of the equation, and then you're going to get Vn of t minus Vn of zero equals V out from zero to T V out so tau D tau. Um, and then you can plug in your V out and then evaluate the integral to get what the actual value of V in is. And so it's just net, it's just three cosine minus three. Uh, minus three, three cosine T. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Since I didn't give you Vns of zero, it's just three cosine T plus any constant you would want to put in. So we have, typically this is something that will, something of this level is what will show up in an exam. So just uh, FYI, um, if you can handle this, you're in good shape and we have two more lectures to get you there if you can't. Um, also something that looks like this could be valid game. All of these circuits look much more complicated than they actually are. The key is always to start by saying, what is what are the voltages in these branches? And in this case, it's zero. So VA equals zero. Once you know what VA is, this the, the op amps are kind of a, a lazy person's uh, game because as a lazy person, you're, what do you call this? You're, uh, you're your itch is to actually do KCL at the branches that have the least amount of currents coming out of them. And if you go in that order, things will usually work out. So in this particular case, if you start with this branch, which has two currents coming out of them, <clears throat> then you're gonna get one equation, then you can apply KCL here, you're gonna get a second equation, and then you can use those equations to find uh, what V out over V in is. And that's kind of the general approach. You, you start by using the two equations that you have for the op amp, which is I, I, min I minus equals I plus, which equals zero. And that uh, the voltages across, so V minus equals V plus, which equals zero. So starting from those, applying these equations, once you apply them, then you move on and do your KCLs uh, to analyze these circuits. And we have six minutes, so we have enough time to analyze this one. So here VA is zero. So we have that uh, <clears throat> zero minus V capital I divided by R1 plus uh, uh, <laughs> zero minus VX divided by R2 has to be equal to zero, so that's check. And then we have a second equation which says that uh, Vx minus zero over R2 plus Vx minus zero over R3 
plus V X minus V out over R four equals zero. Um, and then what we can do is actually just uh, use this equation here to solve for Vx in terms of V out. And once we have Vx in terms of V out, we can back substitute into here and then we're gonna get what, and then use that to find what V out over Vn is. Uh, so here we apply KCL. Uh -huh. And then here we basically got that. So from KCL, you can get that. So I guess I solved it differently, but from KCL, you can get that this is Vx over Vn is equal to negative R2 over R1. And then from this equation, you get that Vx times the parallel sum of one over R is equal to the V out over R4. And then what you can do is basically divide both sides by Vn, and then plug this in for Vx over Vn, um, and then you're done. So basically you have that uh, R4, one over R2 plus one over R3 plus one over R4. Uh, wait, it's so why R4, yeah times negative R2 over R1 equals V out over V in. Is that clear to everyone? Or... Yeah, so that's how you would solve these circuits. Um, I recommend you look at this one. If you can do this circuit, um, I think you can pretty much do any of the circuits we will give you in class. I think this is the most challenging circuit that you will ever encounter when it comes to op amps. Yeah, I put some extra um, examples. I'll go over some more next class and then we'll kind of be done with this material.